This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So, uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.33 p.m. on Tuesday, January 21st. We'll begin with roll call attendance. Um, Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. And McDonald present. I'll turn it over to Chair Hall. All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 6.34 p.m. and start with roll call attendance. Mr. Menino? Menino present. Ms. Barlow? Barlow present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And Hall present. Back to you, Chair McDonald. And seeing a presence of a quorum of the Regional School Committee, I'm calling to order that meeting at 6.34 p.m. Um, and we'll begin again with roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Lord present. Yep, sorry. Um, Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan present. Ms. Seeger? McDonald present. Ms. Seeger? I think before, she before you get on, she said she'll be back in a minute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, great. So I will, um, uh, before we uh, move on, this uh, meeting is being um, live streamed on Amherst Media and on Amherst Media Channel 5, Channel 15, sorry, um, in Amherst um, and is being recorded. And thank you to Amherst Media for all of your support in our um, virtual meetings. Our first item is to approve many minutes. Um, and I believe that what's in our packet are the revised versions um, with the edits that folks that we all sent to them, uh, to send to Ms. Sharkus. That's, the last true. That's true. Mark? I just wanted to add that um, the reason she, uh, Ms. Figaro only included the joint meetings in here just for ease. The other meetings that are backlogged that were just Amherst or just Region or just Pelham, we can do in those meetings, looking at the future meeting calendar, it looks like there will be a number of opportunities for that, but just so that we don't have to have the awkwardness of the Pelham folks waiting for Amherst meetings to be a, um, yep. approved or vice versa. These are only from joint meetings. Great. Uh, so I I will um, make a motion to approve um, the joint meeting minutes as um, included in our packet. Um, is there a second? Second. Now moved by McDonald, seconded by Sitzer. Is there any discussion? Mr. Demling? Um, are you making the motion for the region or Amherst? Because I believe we have to approve them. Each. Oh, right. Um, let's start with Amherst. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. Um, Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the motion passes for Amherst. Uh, Chair Hall? Okay, um, I'll make a motion to approve the joint minutes uh, for Pelham. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Stancer. Okay, we'll do roll call vote. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Ms. Stancer? Dancer, aye. And Hall, aye. Thanks. And I will now make a motion for the region that we approve the joint meeting minutes in our packet. Is there a second? 
Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer, and we'll take a roll call. Is there any discussion? No. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the motion passes. Uh, Seven to zero. Our next item is public comment, and we have a few. Um, we have one voice recording um, and some uh, written comments, but um, if they haven't already been posted, they will be posted on the regional school committee agendas page. But we'll start with the voice um, to give me time to bring up the others. My name is Laura Muller. I am an Amherst resident and parent of a Wildwood student. I am sitting, submitting this message this way in addition to in writing that is available through the school committee website to those who do not watch the meeting. From the beginning, I have watched the discussions about the return to in-school learning with great interest. These discussions focus on a return to in-person school as we knew it pre-pandemic. Even then, the ways our schools were set up did not work for everyone. The question has been, how do we get students back into school buildings? I believe that the Amherst Regional Public School District needs to be bold in this moment and reimagine what our schools should look like moving forward and should use the return to in-person learning as a stepping stone. The world is a very uncertain place these days for everyone. Our routines have been disrupted and need to be reinvented almost weekly. The livelihoods of people in our families and our community have been threatened or taken away and many have lost loved ones and have not been able to gather to grieve. A return to pre-pandemic forms of in-person learning will not solve all of these problems for our students and their families. What we need is to cast the question as to what students need in order to become more whole during this pandemic and beyond. The Amherst Hurricane Boosters recognize the need for more safe, organized play and now have a recess ban. Many community organizations, such as MultiArt, have found ways to engage students' creativity to pr produce performances and other works of art. As a community, we need to recognize the positive elements of remote learning that we might apply beyond the pandemic. For example, some of our students are doing more small group work and are learning to collaborate in problem-based learning as opposed to teacher-driven instruction. Students in remote learning situations are more free to stretch or even to do a cartwheel when sitting still becomes more difficult. Further, our teachers are working hard to teach, while at the same time learning new technologies and experimenting with new modalities for teaching. What knowledge and wisdom have they gained that should, we should be carrying forward to in-person learning? Amherst Regional Public School District should conduct a needs assessment that uses a broad spectrum of tools to hear parent, student, and community voices to ascertain the variety of family needs and priorities for teaching and learning in this pandemic moment and beyond. The school committee has been hearing from families pressing for an immediate return to in-person school, but there are a few public comments from families who chose remote learning about why they have made that choice and what would need to happen for their students to return to in-person school. This information would be valuable in considering how to serve all of the families in the district. School committee members often refer to data and studies without clear citation. The district needs to share all of the data it has with respect to how many and what demographics of families have opted for all remote learning. Any non-anecdotal Amherst Regional Public School System evidence around what system um, So just uh, to, I'm sharing the, the written comment and the full transcript of um, the, the comment that we just heard on um, voice is available in this packet as well so um, folks will be able to see um, she realized that she was cut off and you can see the full comment um, in the writing are folks able to see this the document Thanks.
this last um, letter. I'm scrolling quickly because this is the one that we just received um, the voice, and, but I'll show the last paragraph. And just as a reminder, um, the written uh, document that we just reviewed of public comment um, is posted um, on the agendas page of the Regional School Committee website. And um, our next order of business is the superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Sure. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. And um try to keep things briefer than I have been, but the first one is just um, families may have gotten an email uh, that uh, for, um, we talked about this a while back, but we have now implemented a program called Remind. Some, some schools already had uh, communication tools they're sticking with, but Remind is another tool that allows for um, confidentiality and almost like a text-like uh, communication uh, between families and teachers um, that doesn't just rely on email. Uh, which many people find cumbersome, and many some families of ours don't have email, but um, Remind is a, is a nice way to do that. So thanks to the IS department and folks, and this really came from particularly uh, teachers in our English language learner department who felt like this was going to be a really effective tool um, to reach the families of the students they service. So we're happy to take that feedback from staff and implement it. And it's another example, but it was, it was a significant amount of effort from our, our IS folks, so I want to thank them. Um, Quick vaccine update, um, you know that our school nurses uh, who volunteered for the um, phase one rollout uh, clinics, they worked, but they also were able to get vaccinated um, and I've uh, been working with the town uh, about, you know, our educators are in phase two. The governor's timeline is between February and April. Uh, you know, I think that's, we'll, we'll be within that timeline of making the vaccine available to teachers and working with the town on potential sites. Um, Anything we can do to help the town, uh, not just for our educators actually, but for the larger community. I think it's worth noting that um, we're a regional site for east of the Connecticut River. So some of our towns that uh, aren't just Amherst are still serviced by the Amherst site right now, uh, even for phase one, which is first responders. So just appreciate the collaboration with the town. We're always happy to, if there's things we can do to help that effort, we're gonna be all in on that. We know how important that is and the fight against the virus. Um, so, you know, that's all I have to share. I don't have specific dates of when phase two would start, um, but the indication I got from the town health director was that they were uh, slated for phase two to be able to start um, within the band that the governor originally stated. Uh, when there's more information, we'll be able to share it. I see there's a question, Ms. McDonald. Would you, is it okay to take that now? Yeah, Mr. Menino. Have you compared Amherst with the surrounding schools that have in-person learning with respect to COVID in infections? Are we less infected or are they more affected? Um, let's start answering that question. So uh, I think the range of factors far outseeds the ability to do an analysis that you cite. Um, you know, I think for there being COVID in school settings across Massachusetts, the state has come out with uh, information and does every week on different settings that, that uh, what they're noticing. Um, you know, um, so I, I don't, I don't think it's a, there's a fair way. I'm looking at Ms. Spitzer because I know she is close to this in her her day gig. Not that she does exactly what Mr. Mino was asking, but but I, I think it'd be really really hard from a research perspective to parse out. The implications of re other districts in our area. Um, what I do, what I do know in other districts in our area that have been open more often is often if they've had to close, it wasn't necessarily because of spread in the school. I'm not saying that never happens. To be really clear, I'm not saying that never happens, but it's it's often the community spread impacts the school more than the other way around. I'm just thinking it might be a useful metric when you're having your discussions with the union with regard to. A re, a, 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 an adjustment of the MOA. That's all. I'm just wondering what the experience of the two groups are. Yeah, Miss Miss Spitzer, you were nodding your heads. Hopefully, you were in agreement with what I said because you you certainly know a lot about this topic as well. Yeah, I will say I'm not an expert on this, but from everything I've heard from the folks I work with, it's community spread is reflected in the spread that we often is seen in school. So I think. 
what you said was accurate and I don't have anything to add. And unfortunately, I don't think there is good data out there to answer uh, Mr. Benin's question right now. Um, so uh, what I do an update on swimming. So there are a whole series of events that I don't, uh, I'm going to choose not to get into the weeds of. We have decided to move the swimming to the floating season, which begins on March 1st and ends on April 23rd. Um, so that's our hopes that our own pool will be fixed by then. There are a number of other schools that also are doing swimming in the floating season. So there would be natural schools. And as you remember, it's not like the teams get together in the same pool. They're doing a virtual meet. Um, but that, that will be possible to do. And obviously distance doesn't matter. I mean, frankly, it could be a school on the other side of the state and it really wouldn't make a difference because it's, it's a virtual meet. Um, so um, that's been the better approach based on some of the challenges of finding uh, a pool site that would work for us, um, not related to us, but actually related to the community, actually related to Mr. Menino's comment, the communities w in which the pool was in, uh, you know, uh, got complicated in terms of the use based on community spread in, in those communities. So um, that is a bit of a change from where we were before, but I just wanted to update the community. It wasn't because, and the committee in the community, it wasn't because of anything local to Amherst, um, but it was about pool access and our ability to um, to get kids in safely into a pool that they could use uh, for their practices as well as their competitions. So imperfect, but a better solution to not having a season at all. Um, uh, you know, this was talked about in the previous uh, school committee meeting that was a region meeting, but uh, had a um, good meeting with Ms. Cunningham, Ms. Ortiz, and the APA Executive Board yesterday on this, the motion that passed the three committees last week. Uh, I appreciate their interest in collaboration. The next steps will be uh, working and collaborating with them to develop a survey tool or instrument to assess staff um, interest in returning to work and, and hopefully an FAQ document to go along with that so staff know what protections are there. Uh, after we understand and can develop a program about what seats uh, literally and figuratively are available, um, we do want to then survey families with, with that knowledge about what's possible. Uh, committed to a process where we would have a demograph demographically representative sample of students. In other words, if there are some decisions to make about it, we wanted to uh, make sure that we are uh, all segments of our community are um, in school, like roughly similar percentages, as long as the numbers work out based on what seats we have to offer. Um, but I appreciate the the executive board's willingness to work with us on this. Um, they had some really good points. And, you know, honestly, there was a lot more points of agreement and disagreement when we worked together. It, was, it truly felt collaborative. And so appreciate the committee passing that part of the motion to work collaboratively with the APA because I think it's going to be generative and I think it'll support the outcome we all want. So last two are, um, I've got little um, visuals for us. So the first one is, and this will be in the superintendent um, newsletter tomorrow, but we have updated maps and uh, we got updated information from our vendor who does um, ventilation testing with more good news. Um, as, as you saw last month or the month before, I think maybe it was the beginning of last month, we have, we have plenty of spaces. Uh, the vast majority are we're hitting that four air changes an hour. Uh, our facilities department has made some, some fixes in our schools. And I'll just show uh, one example. Um, let me bring that up. Uh, so on this one, you can uh, hopefully you're able to make out. This is Fort River Elementary School. And the last time there was a quad, actually two um, two of the halvesies uh, that still needed additional work and the fixes uh, were made. And then it was shown that uh, they didn't meet that threshold. So you can see the vast majority of uh, all the big spaces, all the classroom spaces um, are consistent. The gym we're not using this year anyway because of COVID. So that's why that one is it's chock full of furniture we can't use. Uh, but even some of the small group rooms um, that, that are used with students who tested and came out. So we're, we're pretty close to 100% of our spaces across all schools in the district, meaning the four. Certainly, um, we'll have no challenge um, uh, in terms of providing spaces for staff uh, and students that meet that threshold of ASHRAE. So good news on that front. And many thanks again to the facilities department, because when you test all your rooms, um, 
you're going to find some issues because it's not something we have done or most districts have done on a regular basis, but they keep on working and finding um, challenges. And, the, and long term, this is really good that we had this kind of analysis and audit done of our ventilation systems, even separate from COVID. So good news. My last update is an enrollment update. Um, so I'm again going to show uh, a visual. I have to zoom in a little bit for you all to see that. Give me one second. Um, Oops, that's probably too far, sorry. Whoa. Hmm. Uh, why it's being finicky. Okay. Is that reasonable enough to read? Okay, sorry about that. So um, the first uh, column B and C you've already seen, uh, column F you have not. So this is our enrollment in the fall of 19, the October 1 count. The October one count that we went we sh was shared with you in the fall, and actually we did another uh, update on that. And so you could see at the high school um, there was a loss of um, six students, middle school loss of six students, Crocker Farm actually a gain of seven six, seventeen students, and these were often students who were either homeschooling or partial homeschooling who are now, uh, but maybe didn't fill, didn't fill out all the paperwork that they wanted partial and not a full homeschool. So. We see a jump of an, and some of these are just new students who moved to the area. You know, we're not in where last April where we weren't seeing any mobility. Uh, we have had a, in that school in particular, a number of families who have moved into the district over the last couple of months. Uh, so some of this is around changing homeschooling arrangements, but some of this is just purely about new students in the district. Fort River stayed mostly flat. Wildwood um, did lose seven and Pelham is up eight. Um, so, you know, our total number, ooh, I don't know why this is being a little funny tonight. I apologize. So our total is up nine. It's a total net uh, nine student gain from our October one counts till now uh, in terms of our enrollments. Again, spread a little bit differently based on different schools. Um, but I'm sorry that it is being, uh, my computer keeps on being a little wacky. That's probably a better view. Um, but that's my update. I see there's a question. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Mr. Menino? Uh, were the gain in the Pelham School, Pelham residents, or choice students? There is no change in choice students. Thank you. Ms. Lord? <laughs> Sorry. How does this enrollment change from 2019 to 2021 impact our, does it impact our Chapter 70 funding, or is it too soon to tell? Uh, we'll be able to know next week when the governor's budget comes out, the chair sheets come out. Uh, I know there was a lot of advocacy. Well, we won't know, but we'll have an indication, I should say. There's a lot of advocacy, including uh, our state senator, Comerford, and our representative, uh, Dom, about um, preventing uh, Chapter 70 reductions based on reduced enrollment uh, till the governor puts out the budget and the House budget comes out and the Senate budget. And, you know, it's a little hard to know. Um, okay. So governor's budget is slated. Um, I think legally it has to come out next week. I'm not quite sure exactly what, how, it's gonna be a challenging year for budgets to end up on time, both at the state level and then resulting as a result at our local level, uh, cause things will still change, um, but we'll know a little more. And then as that information comes in, we'll share it with the committee and the community. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so on this um, small item, we asked you to do about the uh, developing, implementing the plan for, <laughs> Um, so, um, so we just covered a little bit uh, at the earlier meeting with the APA, but um, is, is there any update that you can give um, the public on the, the pre-K and ILC side letters? Um, the, the reason I ask is that um, those that the effort for for those groups to return voluntarily seems seems to be farther along, given that they're already in side letters with items uh, articulated, um, and we were. We, had, we, had, we were just talking in general terms at the previous meeting about, you know, the, the return of the rest of the volunteers potentially also taking the form of a side letter. So if, if this group has already, you know, met that, um, I don't know if there's, if there's an update you can, you can give on that. Uh, yeah, what I can share is that um, there was, a, as you noted, there was a side letter that um, the committee received from the APA uh, specific to not just ILC, but intensive needs K-12 as well as pre-K, um, this 
committee sent a response. Um, I think there's a lot of shared mutual interest in those. And I think uh, hopefully we're able to work with the APA to take action on that soon. And um, I just have a, a clarification on the on the enrollment. I think um, sort of building on Ms. Lord's observation or question about chapter 70 is I, I think it's also an important distinction that while the three districts enrollment it appears flat, the secondary regional um, enrollment is down 12. Um, and then there's net increases in the Amherst Elementary and the Pelham Elementary. So um, just want to call that, not that the, the overall number isn't relevant either. It's just sort of that, that split because of our districts. Dr. Morris. Sorry, so one thing I meant to highlight and because my, my tab was being finicky, I didn't, is that, that it's, it's sort of a hallmark moment, you know, and I don't mean it's good or bad, but it's, it's meeting, meeting a threshold perhaps. That 877 is high school plus summit. So um, if we're talking about just Amherst Regional High School students, we're under 850. And, and that is a markedly smaller school than that high school has been. And um, I, I, I don't know the number of years, but I'm gonna guess decades. Uh, I feel pretty confident that's the smallest it's been since I've been in this district and I came here in 2001. Um, so, you know, for a while we were thinking, okay, can we stabilize it at a thousand, um, to maintain our level of programming? Um, then it went a little lower and then we're not taking as much choice because and we're making some budget reductions. Um, and, and it made sense not to overfill classes, but, but being under 850 students and next year being slated to be smaller. So in other words, our incoming eighth to ninth is smaller than our graduating senior class. Uh, we're gonna be 815, 820, uh, maybe 810, depends, uh, of students at Amherst Regional High School. So um, I think you're right to note the decline at the region more than at elementary, but I think it's also, we, we try to put Summit, we go back and forth in this all the time, I don't know if we ever get it right. We always try to put Summit uh, with the high school because it is such a small number, you know, and, and there's no secret, it's always around 25 or 30, right? It's, uh, so it's not hard math, but just because it's, it's a low number, we, we feel like protecting, you know, confidentiality. But I think in this instance, just recognizing that the high school is under 850 students is a really, um, important thing as we think about future enrollments you know when we look at future enrollments at the elementary level uh nesdaq enrollments you know they have us pretty flat um in the amherst elementary school pelham's really hard to predict because it's so reliant on choice that you know we don't get really good estimates and you know the census isn't really reliable when you're you're talking about such a small school but uh when we're looking at the region now we're, we're seeing a much much smaller regional high school than we've experienced, and similarly at the middle school as well. Um, that eighth grade going out and the sixth grade coming in, um, you know, we're, 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 we're in a different different group than we were in a couple of years ago. And so, um, sorry to expand on this, but I meant to mention it when I was doing the more general update. It's just something to keep in mind and something to be important. And I think it is gonna be some envisioning of, of what our high school is, uh, if we get down to about 800 students, which we look like we'll probably be there in a couple of years as opposed to a thousand students. Um, Mr. Menino. Is this dis de decrease consistent with national trends or does it seem to be localized? It's consistent with the regional trends. Um, I can't speak to national trends uh, well enough. In general, in the eastern part of the state, they're seeing a bit of expanded enrollment in some um, districts. Uh, in western Massachusetts, especially Hampshire and Franklin County, uh, there's, a, there's a declining enrollment. Uh, COVID reductions is across the state and country. Um, so if you look at districts like Brookline, they've lost hundreds of students uh, this year, just in the paper last week. Um, so, you know, I think the decline that's COVID related is more general, but the general decline, uh, is true for Hampshire and Franklin County districts. And, and it has been going on and, you know, may go on beyond this. And I think that's where we think about, you know, planning and how is that going to impact our district and our schools and the services we provide for students and how we, how we approach that, because there is some economy of scale challenges that as you get smaller, uh, 
uh, it's harder to maintain certain operations and certain uh, programs um, that are easier to maintain when the economy of scale allows for it. Mr. Demling. Yeah, once every few meetings. Um, so two, two questions, um, and I know neither of these are easy to um, answer, but they are the two that pop to the top of my mind immediately when I see this. One is, so in your in your opinion, what strategically or tactically ought we be do, ought we should we be doing um, in order to to mitigate this? In order in order to maximize the number of students who who in our community who who want to choose the families who want to choose to, to come to our our school right obviously there are variables like birth rate and population that are completely out of our control but they're we you know unlike other public services in town we exist in a very competitive marketplace and so um i know this might relate a little bit to like next year planning but um i just just in general you know how do you feel what's your first feeling about you know how, how we how we go at this problem and the, and the other somewhat related question is how do we socialize the budgetary impact of this? Because at a very superficial level, the immediate assumption in the public understanding is, oh, you have fewer students, that means your budget should go down, right? You have, you if, as your students go down, then your costs go down. And so, you know, and, um, you, you mentioned economy of scale, which is a very important, but not easily described <laughs> impact. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, and you know, it, we we don't have a lot of time to, um, you know, this spring and uh, whatever to to get people on understanding the the the, the cuts that we're facing at the region. So, um, two easy questions for you. <laughs> well, on the first one, I don't, you know, our charter numbers are down across all three districts. You know, so you know we're not seeing uh, or Pelham they're flat at zero. So, um, you know, we're not seeing. Um, students go to more charter schools so that financially that's a good thing um and so some of this is you know certainly people making other options and, and we've talked about this before i think some of it frankly is is the demographic trends that we've been seeing for years and now as they roll up the grade levels we're, we're seeing it accelerate and the same thing sort of already happened at the elementary level we have a lot fewer sections in the amherst elementary district than we did five years ago certainly more less than we did 10 years ago when our current seniors were in elementary school. And so as it's in elementary school, it's a little simpler, right? Cause you're like, okay, instead of nine sections per grade level in the Amherst public schools, we'll have eight. And that sort of gradually happens. I'm not saying it doesn't have an impact, but it's, it's more easily understood because there's the cohort model is so clear. I think when you get particularly to the high school level and the cohort model doesn't really apply so much, that's where it's really challenging to think about how do we maintain the comprehensive nature of our high school and the rich level of electives and, and all those pieces when you're, the student population won't, won't allow for it. And I think particularly at the high school level, when we talk about budget cuts, and we'll be talking about those, frankly, soon enough. Uh, the other challenge is that the students choosing the courses sort of drives where some of the cuts go. In other words, we, we look at if there's demand for a course, we can figure out how to offer it, but if there's fewer students, uh, that'll reduce demand, and therefore it's harder to run some of the courses that we historically have run. Um, and, and I know that's a really harsh reality because you know I, something I value is that our course catalog looks a lot like a liberal arts catalog, um, liberal arts college catalog, and we want to maintain as much as we can of that. Um, but if there are fewer students to fill the classes. Um, you know, if we had an infinite budget, sure, we could just run all the sections with very, very small class size, but that's not the case. And we all know that acutely is not the case. So, you know, I think, you know, I'm definitely interested in terms of attracting families back, but I'm also uh, a practical realist in that we are going to have to make some budget cuts this year. And some of those would be, we'd be making, and uh, regardless of COVID, regardless of um, some decline in enrollment, that's related to students making other choices at the secondary level, it's because we have declining enrollment. And we've already realized a lot of those cuts at the elementary schools. Uh, not all of them, but we've, we've realized those by the reduction in, in um, the number of sections of, of classrooms. And when you get to the middle school, and particularly the high school, it get it, as I said, it gets murkier, right? Um, about how you reduce and how do you scale appropriately for the number of students that we have. So complicated question not sure how well i did in answering it but but i think it is 
something that as we hit February and get really deep into budget in all three districts, um, we are going to have to scale our schools to be the appropriate size for the number of students who are attending them. Uh, and that's a really harsh reality because, you know, that might involve reduction of positions. Uh, it, it certainly will, frankly, involve reduction of positions. And that's no one's no one wants to see that. Certainly I don't. It's the least fun part or one of the least fun parts of any uh, educational leader's job. And, you know, I can't recreate students and put them in classrooms. And um, and so, you know, we will be having really hard, uh, very difficult conversations about uh, how can we maintain our level of programming, our level of support, uh, given that the reality is there's fewer students than in our schools than there used to be. And it's 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 the conversation many communities uh, across the state, particularly in the western part of the state, have been having over the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, certainly our representatives from Schutzbear and Leverett um, have have had that at the elementary level, too. I don't want to omit that, that you've had some very difficult conversations at, the, at your elementary level, um, just because I'm not in them, I talk to Jen and <laughs> I, I know that they're happening and I go to town meeting and I hear the same kind of discussions uh, at Leverett and Shutesbury town meeting as well. But as they filtered up to the high school and the middle school, um, the kind of the matrix of decision making gets a little bit more complex just because they're, the cohort model doesn't exist in the same way. Sorry, it's like ending on a downer, but um, you know, it's a segue to our next couple of meetings, frankly. Any other questions from the, for the superintendent? Not seeing any. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, maybe I'll be able to make up some of the time. Um, we have the uh, chair's update, and I think uh, for um, all I will add, uh, Dr. Morris talked about the meetings that that um, that he and the assistant superintendent have been having with the with the APA executive board. And for those that weren't online um, an, an hour and a half ago, um, the regional school committee has been meeting over the last three weeks. Um, in a uh, joint session with the APEA executive board, and we just came out of one just now. Um, I just, my personal opinion, those have been um, productive and collaborative. And um, while we don't have the next meeting scheduled right now, we do have a commitment, um, a shared commitment to work on some joint communication about the work that we're doing together um, and figure out ways to continue um, this transparent and open communication between our two groups. Um, so I wanted to share that um, in case folks hadn't noticed that um, that meeting was on our calendar also this evening. Um, Chair Hall, do you have any updates? No, nope, not tonight. Thanks. Moving to announcement from school committee members. Ms. Dancer. Um, we had our budget subcommittee committee meeting last week and um, I think made some pretty good progress with Dr. Slaughter's significant help. Um, and our goal will be to have some kind of document that can go out before the next four town meeting so that um, people would have time to go through it, envisioning something that might be four or five pages, not uh, that would give some definitions of some things and some data, historical data, um, to get people background um, before we have the really difficult conversations we're gonna have to have. Thank you. Any other announcements? No, okay. So moving right along, um, we will move to our new and continuing business. And our first item is looking at the calendar for 2020-2021 and Juneteenth holidays. Holidays. Yeah. So um, I wanted to bring up the topic. Um, so as you know, we put Juneteenth on our school calendar last spring. As you're aware, we allowed staff who were interested in taking it um, to take it as a holiday, as as probably should have been done many, many years ago, but um, 
we did we, we put that in place last spring and did have people take and appreciate it. It was school year was done at that point, so it didn't affect the academic years for full year staff only, uh, mostly administrators and administrative staff. Um, this year, Juneteenth come, falls on a Saturday, um, and it's on our calendar. And you know, over the summer after our calendar was published, uh, Governor Baker um, and the state made it a state holiday. And, um, you know, some conversations I was having uh, with some of our district leaders really felt strongly that we should have that Friday off as Juneteenth observed, um, that, you know, if it was any other state holiday and it happened to fall on the weekend, like Veterans Day or um, other holidays, um, July 4th, which affects the administrative staff. But uh, we, would, we wouldn't ever think, oh, it's on the weekend, we're not going to we're just going to have school the day before like we normally would, right? And Juneteenth, much like I, I pick up Veterans Day because Veterans Day happens on November 11th every year, regardless of what day of the week it is. It's not a holiday like Indigenous People's Day, which falls on the second Monday in October or whatever it is. Um, so what I guess I'd ask your permission for is to adjust the school calendar. Um, I know it extends a day in late June, which is not everyone's idea of a good time, perhaps, but it's still the right thing to do. And because it's inconvenient or when it happens, I still think, you know, we should be taking the day off. Uh, it's a holiday that's important to, to should be important to all of us. And it's particularly important to many people in our community. And it doesn't feel great that we, the first year we're really doing something formally about it. Cause last year was very kind of um, done last minute that we're not actually, we're having school. Like it's a normal day. Um, it doesn't feel right to us. Um, I did share this as any other calendar item with the APA. They fully endorsed having that Friday the 18th off, uh, adding day to the end of the school year um, to accommodate that. And so I wanted to bring this body and make sure that, or just see where you all are on this particular topic. Um, but for, for myself, I feel really strongly about it. Um, and, and I think as administrative team, we've talked about it. And um, again, it will be an inconvenience for people. And it uh, you know, and well, I'll hear that, you'll hear that. Uh, but I think more importantly for many people, it would be an acknowledgement of, of a holiday that's uh, long overdue in terms of being acknowledged and celebrated. And that seems more important to me than um, any negative feedback we, we may receive um, on the topic. So I guess, you know, looking for the board's um, su support, and if not, then so be it. But uh, I at least want to bring up the topic, and this one I'm certainly not neutral about. Can I ask a, a clarifying or confirming question? Um, the school calendar is a regional school committee decision, and does it change require a vote, or are we because it's already voted? We're just nodding alignment with it, or not? Um, uh, you know, I think it's a gray area. Um, I think if the region is okay taking a vote, um, I think that's fine. And I know it was a joint meeting, but since it in influences Amherst and Pelham. It felt like a good topic that if someone in Pelham had a question about, they'd actually have not, because we don't want to wait too long in this one. It's already late January. Um, so if someone in Pelham had a question, not wait to the next Pelham School Committee meeting on February 11th, and then ask a question and then have it go back to the region, just felt like um, we should either sort of agree that it's a good idea or agree it's not a good idea and, and do it for next year's calendar or something like that. I guess I should have asked my questions the other way. Does it require a vote? And if so, is it just the region or all three bodies? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think it's probably a good idea for the region to vote on it. I don't know if technically it requires it, but I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's something I'd appreciate just so that if anyone asks, it's not something that I can just say, oh, everyone nodded their head. You could go back to the video, but actually formal <laughs> vote to um, just adjust the calendar to include Juneteenth as a day off of school. Okay. Um, yeah. And the other committees could vote in support, but it wouldn't be a binding vote, certainly, for Amherst or the Pelham. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Manita, did you have a comment or a question? No. So th I'm seeing a thumbs up from Mr. Manita. Any, uh, Ms. Lord? Oh, you unmuted. I just assumed that was like. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I just wanted to voice my strong support for this and um, my gratitude that we're talking about it now, even if it's later than we might've wanted to, but here we are, so thank you. I, I second um, Ms. Lord's uh, perspective on that. Any other thoughts or concerns? Questions?
I'm going to take that, but we, um, um, I will then make a motion um, for that the uh, regional school committee approve the proposed addition of the of June 18th as a um, school holiday in, rec in uh, recognition of Juneteenth um, and, add, and add the second, the, a day at the end of the year. Um, Lord second. Any further discussion? We want to take a roll call vote, Mr. Demling. Emily, aye. Um, Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We'll send a revised calendar out um, probably tomorrow afternoon to everyone. If not, then we'll, we'll do it next week, the week after. Mr. Menino. Could the Pelham School Committee uh, make a non-binding vote of support? I think that's a question for Ms. Hall, perhaps, yeah. but it, yes. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't know. I I mean, I It's a non-binding sure. vote. <laughs> Let's have a non-binding vote. Okay. I will second that. Does it, I mean, do we need to do a formal vote or just, I mean, it's not really. I, I think you could you could do a roll call vote if, if the committee wants to. I mean, it's not okay. binding, but you know, it's Am we're in Amherst and Pelham. We do lots of nine binding votes. So uh, there's nothing preventing you from doing Okay, that. great. Moved by Benino, seconded by Hall. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, we'll do roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Dancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, it'll be interesting. I don't know what other school districts are doing, but um, hopefully this, in my opinion, hopefully, uh, I don't know if other, I haven't heard of other school districts taking the day off as a celebrated, but hopefully we get some um, notice out um, and other districts start thinking about this as well because um, it's not just Amherst that it's important it's important in other places so thank you all for the support of that and um, I appreciate it and we'll again we'll get that out to families and staff as soon as we can um, so moving on to our next item which is still on calendars but now we're looking at the next school year 2021 and two back to Morris yeah, so a couple of months ago, we had a conversation about perhaps uh, starting the school year at a different time. And as I've thought about it more and had more conversations with my team, um, you know, we're not in the place where we think we could have a, a, a radically different or even much moderately different school year next year uh, for a number of reasons. One, um, you know, I think I talked about the heating and cooling systems, and I think the ship has sailed in terms of taking, you know, direct action that would be implementable um, this summer on that. Uh, I think secondly, um, we do have summer service. We're going to go very late in the school year this year um, because we have the long December break. Um, you know, we do have summer program services for um, many students, but particularly students with special needs. And um, that extends, you know, we have students who are on a four week program. We have students who are on a six week program. Um, and, and when we start backing those up to the beginning of this, the next school year, both the administrators and the teachers who work in those, at some point, everybody does need to take a break. Um, and, and when we started looking at it, everything starts backing into one another in a way where um, I just don't think it's all that plausible to start the school year even a couple weeks earlier and do it successfully. I mean, I think the last thing I'll say, we know a lot more now than we did before uh, about running school and, and planning for safety. Uh, and while there's a vaccine that I think will be available for all educators, I feel confident it'll be all available for all educators by the end of this school year, so well before the beginning of next school year. Um, that's highly unlikely that it'll even be available for students under the age of 12. Um, so our, you know, maybe for, you know, we have trials going, uh, not we, but there are trials going for vaccines for um, children age 12 to 18. There's not even a trial that I'm aware of that's that's started for students below the age of 12. So, you know, we will have continued planning. Um, we don't assume that every single student's going to return to in-person learning, even if that's the primary mode of, that we're offering next year, because um, some of those concerns may still be realized. Those same concerns that, ex that folks expressed and wanting distance learning this year uh, may go on. So I think we're, we're still going to be in the kind of significant planning mode, uh, even if um, 
some of the other pieces are better next fall than we are now. So I guess what I'd like to see the committee's um, thoughts are is that, you know, I'd like to start moving forward with a, a more typical schedule for the next school year. And, and we're a little, for understandable reasons, I'm a little late on, on moving forward with that, but I didn't want to start drafting a schedule for your consideration of the APAs, which is typical, uh, if, if you still wanted to explore more about an earlier start, you know, um, I just think based on kind of our programmatic services, uh, as well as our heating cooling system, I just have a hard time thinking of a, a significantly different start time uh, to the next school year next year. Um, so I, I wanted to say that out loud to you in the community. So we had that conversation. I wanted to see what questions you had. Uh, and then I want to get to work to try to put something together. Um, so that in, in relatively short order, we could be considering a calendar for the next school year, because I know many families are asking and staff members are asking because, you know, we used to do this in March and then, you know, we did it in December and people were really happy to have it that far in advance. I think everyone understands that that far in advance feels different than it did a year ago. But um, that being said, I do think if we can take some some relatively quick action on this, I think it would reassure everybody. I will say also that we received some negative, I received some negative feedback from staff about the idea of starting a lot earlier. That's unrelated to any of the reasons I said, um, just about um, family, family planning, you know, uh, people I think are feeling like maybe they're taking more trips this summer and um, some of those, you know, might be interrupted if we had that much of a change. So I did receive some negative feedback, not from administrative staff, but from teaching staff on that um, that topic as well. So I know I'm painting a pretty clear picture, you know, in terms of my thoughts on it. But that being said, I wanted to bring it to the committee and see what questions you had or other ideas you had to for me to explore. What are folks' questions? Mr. Demling? Yeah, so um, thank you for that update. Um, that is the core of what I was really wondering is what are the practical implementation details and how does this affect staff? Um, how does this affect um, everything that our building leadership and staff need to do? So that update on the facilities and the impact of summer school, um, I find particularly compelling. I'm, I'm also, I, I understand what you say about the vaccine that, that kids under 12, you know, we can't expect them to have this fall, but the fact that the vaccine has rolled out much quicker than we all thought it might has changed my thinking on the urgency to think radically out of the box in terms of school calendar. You know, I think when we first had this discussion, vaccines were nowhere in sight and there was there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And we can we can debate how bright that light is right now and how far the, far the tunnel is. But the light is at the end of the tunnel, at least for adult vaccination and, and that that changes the game i mean it it doesn't solve it <laughs> let me be clear you know we're, we're gonna have you know covid with us for for a long long time um but it it, it does um it, it's a different reality than my gosh we can't do anything except for hope for great weather is going to somehow uh, you know mitigate and I'll, I'll also be frank, and I don't mind saying this as a public official, I think the change in administration at the national level is a very positive sign for the return, safe return of uh, children to schools, just in terms of, you know, how we think the um, pro progress of the virus is going to go uh, in terms of mitigation and, and strategies and whatnot. So I th that's another big variable um, for me. What, what, you know, so you brought up summer school, um, and, um, you know, summer school is, is for a number of different reasons. Um, for obvious reasons, we're going to have potentially a significantly larger number of students who um, are going to be um, behind or or not not where we want them to be. I don't mean to use that as a trigger term, but like you know, students who who um, don't have the skills that we would have otherwise liked them to have or that they otherwise would have acquired, um, you know, th through this pandemic. Um, so is there thoughts to significantly expanding that? Obviously it comes with a cost <laughs> and cost is not our friend these days, but um, it, is, it is something I think about when I think about the summer and, try, and, and, and how we support kids you know, back, to, um, back to the buildings. Yeah, so uh, my short answer is uh, we do actively think about that. Uh, and Faye Brady does and Joanne Smith and uh, other folks. I think we also are in the place, and this is going to be a theme you're going to hear about in the next couple of weeks in budget conversations. 
Uh, so I like the optimism, as you all know. I was pessimistic we'd be where we are on January 21st with a couple of 90 plus percent effective vaccines. Um, I'd rather be pessimistic than be disappointed. And so I can be elated and happy about that. Uh, but I think on a larger scale, both for the fall and then, you know, the summer, um, what we don't know is how many of those families would want to access services in person versus remotely. And that has an implication on cost. And it's actually really hard to do both. Right. Um, it, it, by hard, I mean expensive. Right. Because uh, y- you can only have X number of teachers doing if they're teaching kids there. Uh, how are the other students accessing those services? So, you know, it is act- those are active conversations we're happening are happening. And we are do have some level of concern about how to run parallel programs of in-person and virtual uh, moving forward. So, uh, yes, we're thinking about it, um, planning for it, you know, have dates for it, knowing the end of the year, July 4th and uh, our typical start date for uh, summer services. But it is hard to put um, a kind of very explicit point on. Um, I think we'll know more about that in the next month or two as we see uh, vaccine rollout, to your point, to educators, but also about the comfort levels of return to in-person. I also want to say, like, none of this is to suggest that the ideas that came up with the committee were bad ideas about starting having a different school year schedule. It's just I'm not sure. My question is really about feasibility of implementation, not on feasibility of or not on whether it's a good idea or not. Ms. Spitzer. Um, so I guess I have a couple questions. One is, so last year we had kind of a last fall was just hard in a lot of ways but one of the things was we started late because of i think negotiations on the state level i it feels like it was ages ago but i am looking at the calendar now i think we started september 16th so i think Mm -hmm. one of the things would be useful to know is remind us when would be a normal start date like what what are we um i'm looking at the 20 21 September and I'm noticing we've got Labor Day and Rosh Hashanah right on top of each other. So I would highly recommend that we don't have a first day for either kindergarten or any of our students happen on um, that, on Rosh Hashanah itself, which is to the Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, just because I'd hate to make somebody choose between uh, missing their first day and observing a holiday. Um, the other thing I want to say is I just, I, I'm. I, it sounds like you're making totally the right decision by not moving the start date up dramatically. I think I would love to have some, if we're going to lose days, let's not lose them in the fall. So if there are going to be factors that are going to cause us to have to have more professional development, if there are factors that are going to cause us to need to have shorter days, you know, there, there are a lot of things that affected our calendar this year and where we lost the most number of days was when kids could be outside the most, when we could open windows the most, and where we had the the best um, chances of keep, when the numbers were the lowest for the virus. So I feel like we kind of, for, I'm not blaming anybody, but just observing that like we squandered the time when the rates were the lowest. Um, and, and I don't want to see that repeat. And if anything, I'd love to see ways that we can kind of take opportunities for outdoor learning and expand them. Um, and because I think that's one of the most positive things I've seen happening for my kids who are too young to be in our district schools, but are um, participating and learning in daycare and preschools is that they are spending more time than ever outdoors because of the pandemic. And I think that's one of the silver linings of this pandemic is this new exploration of the outdoors that's been driven by a need to, to reduce the risk of transmission. And this would be true for like the flu or, you know, other, you know, coronaviruses that hopefully, you know, we, hopefully we won't have any new pandemics, but it, it just seems like for health reasons, there are a lot of advantages to increasing the amount of time we're opening in the fall and maybe continuing to have kind of longer breaks in the, in the winter. Um, anyway, so those are my thoughts on this, but I think, I think you're laying out good reasons to not radically shift it, but I, I just don't want to see us again, miss opportunities to have our schools open during the fall months. Yeah. So just a uh, quick response is we did have those 10 days before the school year started for students as per the state piece, like you noted, it wasn't a local decision. Uh, I think as we look to next year, Labor Day, as you know, is on, <clears throat> excuse me, on September 6th. Uh, the past practice that we've had is to start the week before, some point the week before. I think you raised a really good idea about not pushing parents to make a very difficult decision between the high holiday celebration of their kids' first day of kindergarten. Um, 
and I think we can certainly have the conversation, you know, and, and typically um, if the school year, if student, if teachers are required to be there, I think before April, September 1st, then they have to approve any schedule. So that's like, you know, in the contract. Um, but the, as long as I've been doing this, um, this job, uh, we've started before Labor Day and there's been broad support for that. And typically what happens is Ms. Moore, Ms. Moreland creates a couple different schedules that start at different times. Uh, I'll bring it here. I'll bring it to the APA. They'll offer feedback and then you'll vote on it. So I think we can show a couple different varieties of schedules, some starting earlier, some starting later, uh, and gather feedback on what the best approach would be moving forward and, and about to like simulate that process again. But thank you for that specific feedback. It's really helpful. I think um, I'd just like to layer in, um, uh, I'd like to see at least one, if not except most of the options that we look at, um, revert back to our usual sort of vacation um, and holiday schedule. Um, I heard feedback, not just um, here in my own household from my two kids, that, um, but from others that the two weeks at, at um, winter break was actually challenging. Um, and so I'm not sure, um, also because if we are, be, assuming we are in person, we're going to have snow days next year. So we won't have, um, we, we won't have that ability. And so that will just extend all the way into the end of June um, if, if we do sort of add additional holiday breaks. So I, I would sort of encourage us to sort of balance that thinking um, so that we're not, we're balancing where we end the year also with sort of the rest of the breaks and holidays. Yep. Any other um, thoughts, questions um, about starting? I think that was the key question. Seems like um, we are aligned on, on your proposal, Dr. Morris. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, miss, I'll work with Ms. Moreland uh, to come up with some drafts. We'll share them with APA. We'll share them with you, and then we can take the next steps to try to, you know, lock this down in the next couple of weeks. Thank Great. you very much. Um, and our next item is um, the change in start time. So another turn it back over to you. Again, Dr. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be brief on this one. I think, I mean, then maybe there's more questions, but I time myself because I did a audio recording of this um, uh, presentation. It took six and a half minutes. So hopefully uh, probably with you, I'll take a little longer because I was trying to be incredibly brief on that. But um, it's the same slides that are, uh, I'll share slides are in the packet, but um, same slides I'm going to share. We did a staff town hall today, we do family town halls next week. And more of these, nothing will change. So uh, you'll get sick of hearing these. If you attend any of those, I apologize, but um, I'll try to go through them relatively briefly. So let me get that, those slides up. There it is. Okay. Um, so I want to start by just, and I know the committee's heard this, but I just want to, I can't say it enough times. This is not a new conversation to this district. Um, this is a conversation that comes up in my experience every couple of years. It came up very acutely in 2011 and 2012, which with what I thought was an excellent report that was done by a large committee, it ended up not getting voted for a whole host of reasons. Um, but it's while we're considering it, uh, and I'll talk about why we're considering it now a little later, um, there's a lot of people who did a lot of work on this that we I'm deeply appreciative of, um, and they really set the stage for the conversation this year. Um, so I'll just start with a very quick summary. There's hyperlinks, uh, you know, and, and we'll put this on our website. Um, I'm not going to go over them now, but the research, you know, there's a hyperlink to about a dozen articles uh, about um, school start time. Um, but, you know, what basically what they find, uh, and it's one of the few areas of educational research where there's, there's really significant clarity uh, and not a lot of countervailing uh, evidence is that students um, are used to, they will get more sleep. So I know a lot of the kind of feedback that I heard a couple of years ago when this topic came up is they're just going to stay up later. They won't actually sleep more. And the research I've read indicates that, you know, they'll sleep for about, uh, teenagers will sleep for about three quarters of the time that you give them. Um, so in other words, if you extend the, if you make the school day start an hour and 15 minutes later, they're going to get about 50 minutes more sleep every night. 
They're not going to maybe get all 75 minutes, <laughs> but they're going to get the majority of that as sleep. And yes, they'll stay up a little bit later, but they will actually get more sleep. Um, that in terms of outcomes, they see reduced suspensions, better performance and higher course grades. And it does seem like the impact is greater on students that are historically and currently underserved in our schools as well as schools across the country. It's also true that uh, there's a redu reduction in tardiness and absences um, and also a reduced likelihood of car crashes for students um, driving to school. And I, for anyone who thinks that that is a statistic not worth mentioning, I, would, I wouldn't recommend this uh, necessarily, but if you want to Google car crashes, uh, high school students driving to school, you will see an absolutely um, depressing number. Uh, you, even if you could just look, put it in Massachusetts, um, it, it happens more often than we'd like to believe. And even if it doesn't happen in our particular community, it, it's happened recently uh, in the last couple of years in communities near us. And so it's not something that I would take lightly. So I know it seems like a little bit of an outlier. I've gotten that feedback on this slide, but I think it, it is something that should be uh, part of our discussion, and you can see the CDC made a nice slide about some other wellness pieces uh, about physical activity, mental health, uh, risk behaviors um, also are impacted by um, adolescents who don't get enough sleep. Uh, this is a slide that was created by one of my colleagues on the Cape, um, and I, you know, came from research and at the um, just really interesting about their circadian wake up times that are typical for students under 11 at 16 and at 18, uh, an ideal school start time now. You know, sadly for the seniors, we cannot start logistically. We can't make it work to start at 11 o'clock. I know many of them would greatly enjoy that. And some of you have high school students and probably left to their own devices. That's about the right time for them to start. Now we can't do that and run our program. Uh, but I think this, this slide for me highlights the, um, the real disparity in the way we've organized schools with elementary school starting after secondary schools and the way that human beings are. Um, that it really is uh, the, the flip of how, you, how we'd want to do that. So our current situation, I'll, t I'll stop for, it's not a long slide deck, but I'll stop for questions or comments after the, the next slide. Our current situation prior to the COVID schedule was that there was about a 7.30 a.m. bus drop off and teacher start time at the regional school. 7.45 is when the bell rang for students to be in school and class. Our first pickup in the lovely town of Shutesbury was at 6.37 in the morning. Um, that's our, our earliest one. Uh, we have seven buses that have pickup times before seven o'clock in the morning and they span all four of our member towns. Uh, have a bus where a student's pickup time is before seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you think of that contrasted to the slide before, and you can you can see the impact um, that it has. At our elementary schools, at this point, we're about at 8.30, 8.35 maybe, bus drop off at the elementary level. We do have a couple buses that pick up times are early. There's one Pelham bus. It says 7.43 on the schedule. My experience, and Pelham folks will know this, is not that not everyone in Pelham who can ride the bus does ride the bus. Um, so in reality, it is a little bit later than 7.40. It's more closer to 7.50, uh, but we have to we have the stops laid out. And then when the parents tell us that their kids are never taking the bus, then we adjust backwards from there. Um, so that, that bus is a little bit of an outlier, um, but um, in, in past years. This year at the regional schools, we did have a different schedule because of the COVID and we started at nine o'clock. And, and yeah, while we'd never want the reason to be COVID and all the, the death and devastation and illness that's come from it, it's been eye-opening for us because we had this bizarre natural experiment of what it would be if we didn't have school start until nine o'clock at the regional level. Uh, I think I said this at another meeting, I can't have a conversation with a middle school or high school student without them bringing up, oh my God, we're not going back to 745 next year, are we? I mean, it's universal that that comes up in any conversation. Some of you have had middle school or high schoolers as well. And I think if you polled them, they might, they might think negatively of 745 transition uh, for next year. And we'll have a student, hall, student uh, town hall, and I'm actually going to do some of that polling of when they, would, when they wake up, when there's nothing to wake up for. In other words, they don't have an activity on the weekend or school. What time would be their natural wake up time? I'm really curious what they tell me. Um, and so um, I think the time I do, I think it's like after 11 is my latest category. Cause I think once you get after 11 in the morning, I think all bets are off, right? Um, but um, so we've had this natural experiment and despite all the concerns and we've heard them, you've heard them uh, all year about, you know, distance learning and, and some people feeling like it's not working well, 
um, there really is um, such appreciation for the later start time and this natural experiment that wasn't designed to be for this reason that I think it is time that we you know have that conversation and explore this at this moment in time um, so that we um, you know we we can um, we can take some next steps in exploring this. Um, you know, I think the other process was a multi-year process with a 50 some odd page report. As I shared uh, last time we talked about this, there's no time for that. Um, and I actually think hopefully the choices are more simple because so much work's been done on this both locally, but also beyond in terms of the research space. So why don't I pause? I mean, I could keep going, but maybe I'll pause here and see if there are comments or questions. And if I say it'll be, I'll get to it later, I'll, I'll let you know, but there may be questions on the specific slides that I've shared so far. Mr. Demling? Uh, so on, on the note that the benefits of uh, reduced suspensions and academic increased academic performance are especially for underserved students, um, I assume that that's, you draw that conclusion based on the research. How, how well established do you think that conclusion is in the research? It's obviously a very compelling point. So um, what, what is, is, is this an emerging in, indicator? Is, the, is, this, is this something that, that has been really thoroughly established oh, what's what's your take on that yeah i think there's been i mean there, there's not that many areas that have been I mean, how to say this relative to educational research this is actually a pretty easy one because you either start at a certain time or you start at a different time the challenge with educational research is the number of variables is often too great and it makes it very hard to come up with confident uh solutions or uh correlations and i think there's been enough schools across the country that have made this change that we are able to feel much more confident than we would feel on other areas of research um you know i, I think i mentioned before but someone um i know loosely uh from a long time ago was a professor at columbia and he he talked about and he's an economist so he's looking at this at a very different lens than than most of us in the room and, and he actually was able to using other research and his analysis tools ascribe a life earnings gain from a later start time you know, like an a like true financial gain for students who have a later start time based on all the other factors that are so clear in the research um so you know his research is that you know any any investment that you make in this and we're trying to do this as cost neutral as we can you'll get a, a nine to one return you know uh in terms of return on investment in terms of academic achievement and, and that's obviously correlated to tardies and absences uh, and that, and he, he is a model, and I can't describe it because I'm not an economist, uh, that actually uh, ascribes a financial gain, uh, a significant financial gain for students with this change uh, in terms of their lifetime earnings. So that's way beyond me, but for someone who has that level of skill to take educational research and be able to quantify it in that way, that, that's a pretty atypical thing in educational research. Um, so I feel confident. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I was asking if the folks uh, were ready to move on to, um, or more questions right now. Ready? Okay. Move okay. On. Um, so here's some data from last year about uh, this one's particularly from the high school. We had 113 days in session at the high school last year. On average, 7% of students or 63 students were late on a daily basis. Um, the numbers actually are worse than this because at the beginning of the year, there's very few tardies. So like if you look at the first two weeks, the number of tardies is, is minuscule. And then it increases as cold weather starts. It increases as the days get shorter um, and the weather gets worse. And so I think if we were to play this out over a whole year and frankly, June, looking historically, not our most wonderful month for tardies, right? I mean, you can, you can think of all of you when you were in school and you got to June and, and perhaps getting up. Uh, was a little bit harder uh, in getting to class. So uh, we have really do have a significant tardy problem in general, and our high school administrator is doing a great job of communicating on this, but 7% is a lot of kids on a daily basis to be, to be out. And anecdotally, both at the middle school and high school, we hear many, many reports of students really struggling to attend to class. Um, I had a couple of educators tell me that 
you know, um, if they can have, if they can get an A period prep, in other words, if they can have their prep period first period, that's always what they try for because they know it's so hard to teach A period students. Um, and not that students aren't tired late in their day. And this is, I know, one thing that came up even in dialogue some educators the other day, um, you know, that it's not that students won't be tired if we start late, start later because the natural impulse of students, right, that there's some, that's the nature of it, but they'll be tired and have gotten more sleep. And there's a real big difference uh, on that. So it's, you know, when we get later in the day, even if students, you know, A period's harder, it gets a little better, they still haven't gotten enough sleep. It's still affecting their cognitive processing. And so, um, you know, this is a local data for us, and this is qualitative, uh, but it is something really important I hear from educators and students routinely um, about A period classes. So we really only have two options. So I actually like binary choices these days, uh, especially if we have to make an, uh, a decision pretty quickly. And so the two options, one is to revert back to the prior schedule. Um, so elementary runs stay as normal and secondary goes back to 745 bell. Or we could flip the elementary and secondary school schedules. The elementary school buses arriving at 810 about, uh, so about 20, 25 minutes earlier than they currently do. And secondary school is about 905. I'll get into it a little bit in a little bit. So uh, we're trying to shrink that gap um, a little bit between secondary and elementary. And, you know, originally I talked about, uh, well, maybe we can just push everything back half an hour. And in um, multiple meetings with their Union 28 friends and Shoots Baron Lebert, just it does it doesn't work for them. It also doesn't get the same benefits for the regional students. So I'm not listing that as an option because I don't. I think we want to work with our collaboratively with our Shoots Bear Leverett partners, uh, and I think if we're going to do it, let's get the bang for the buck. Um, and and you get to, the last slide here talks about the number of organizations who recommend an 8:30 or later start, and to do that, we'd have to do the flip. So why now? Uh, again, there's a hyperlink to this article, really good article by John Mehta in the New York Times. Um, you know, as I said before, we have this opportunity. We have had this experience. Uh, we, we now have a year experiment with positive data, uh, qualitative data granted, but qual positive data about the impact of a later start time. And I think what we know is the inertia is there. Once we go back to our former schedule, it's gonna be harder to change. So I think for me, if we're going to do it, we should do it now. Uh, if we're not going to do it, then, then so be it. But to think about waiting a year and trying to do it after we flip-flop times again and again, uh, I think that's really hard on kids. And I think if we're going to do it, we should try to push forward, given the experience we've had and the feedback we've gotten. Here's some data from Northampton. Um, this is from December, so just last month. They surveyed their um, stakeholder groups, students, families, and um, staff. Their current schedule, you can see on the right there, um, proposal A and B were just variations on a theme of a later start time. They just flipped JFK as their middle school and, and NHS as their high school. And you can see there was overwhelming support for the flip. So if you combine proposal A and proposal B, which both involve a flip of the elementary and secondary schedules, it was the vast majority of that community. Uh, similar to us, they've done study upon study. Um, about late start over the years, and they just decided, hey, let's just see where people are in this, and there was broad support in the community, and they're pushing forward. Um, much like us, they won't have every question answered by the time they vote, um, and that's a hard thing, but I think we are working hard uh, on answering as many logistical questions as we can uh, before we'd come to uh, a vote for you all to take. So there are some real local implications on logistics and schedules, and I think, you know, some people may feel like some of these are ill-defined or we don't have all the solutions yet, and, and, and I'll explain why as we go. So, you know, the elementary, we certainly have earlier bus runs for some families. Uh, as we talked about the last time we talked about this topic, that would be really helpful for other families, much less so. Um, after school programs, again, would have to start 20, 25 minutes sooner. Uh, so it add hours and they might have more demand. So Dr. Guevara has been connecting and will continue to connect with the after school programs on this topic uh, because of the earlier dismissal. At the secondary level, we are working to see how can we reduce transition times so that uh, we can end as early as possible given the late start time uh, for all the different activities that students have. Uh, when we get to athletics, we are looking at a schedule, particularly at the high school level, uh, that might have flexibility at the end of the day. So right now, athletics can't start before 3 o'clock. Uh, and we feel like even if the school day technically would go on, we could maybe either have advisory or some other things towards the end of the day so that it would be a very low impact on athletics um, in terms of the kind of 
especially when we get to like late fall and it's getting dark sooner and other things. Uh, so, you know, I really want to thank Talib, Mickey, and Sam because they're working really hard to think about what schedules uh, would allow for the same level of instruction, but uh, allow for students involved in some extracurriculars, particularly athletics if it's away games or sports where that, that time of year where the daylight gets to be difficult, right? None of this is a problem in September. Um, you get into November and daylight savings happens, all of a sudden it's, sudden it's an issue. And, and they have some really interesting flexible models uh, that we, we're looking at. And um, I think one of the things that would likely happen at the end of this, if we move forward, is we would, we would you know, go work with our association on impact bargaining, some of those parts of it. So one of the reasons I'm not being as explicit now is I want to trust the process that if we want to do it, we should do it because we think it's the right thing for kids uh, and know that we'll work to find solutions for some of the challenges. Um, I think one of the things that we're also looking at, both at the slide says regional level, and that's certainly more true, but at the elementary level, we're one of very, very few districts who go as close to door to door for pickups for our secondary school students. Um, I will say that that almost no one in the world does that, or in our world in Western Mass does that. It's very atypical. The school committee policy says that students can walk as far as a mile and a half, and we are actively looking at some of our stops that greatly expand the length of bus runs that could be accommodated with relatively minor walks uh, to bus stops. Uh, these are students who are older, uh, they should be able to manage that and we think we can cut down the times and frankly we think we can also be better for the environment that way as well. There's fewer stops and less buses, the buses are on the less, that's better in terms of our carbon footprint. So I think it's beneficial in terms of the conversation here but it's probably, you know, and I'll own this, a long overdue conversation about uh, what are we doing and what is our carbon footprint? So we can talk about electric buses. Certainly, we, we like that we have one. Um, if all of our buses had fewer stops because we're asking students to walk a little bit, uh, that's going to have, a, a, you know, I, I don't want to say more because comparison is not helpful. It's going to have a significant impact on our carbon footprint. And so we think it benefits because if we shrink the amount of time our rus runs are on, it means kids are on buses less time. It also means that we can fine tune some of those start times to maybe be a little narrower band. We are looking at the elementary level at that too, uh, not at the same scale, uh, but there are bus stops um, that are, I know of bus stops that students can see their friends 200 yards away on either side of them and the bus is making three stops. Um, at some point, we, we just have to say, and this is very atypical as well for schools, um, that if it's a safe place to walk, which always has to be critical, right? 200 yards could be really dangerous, but also 200 yards could be on the same road with a sidewalk with no cross streets. We, we may be asking families to do a little more walking and students do a little more walking next year to make these times tighter and also because we think it's better for our environment. Um, so that that's part of this discussion as well. Finally, on this slide, we're, we are, it would involve changes to the start and end times of staff, probably at the elementary level in a very minor way. Um, at the secondary level, secondary level, a little bit more. And again, that's where we'd work with our bargaining units uh, to talk about the impact and make sure that we're um, trying to make as minor changes as we can, because we know it has an impact on fam you know for families and and planning for our staff members. So, uh, kind of that's why we have these family, uh, the staff town hall today, and we'll continue to have multiple opportunities because we want to get staff feedback on these kind of things. Today's was uh, really, really interesting ideas and very helpful feedback. So on that topic engagement, these are the groups we're looking to engage with. Uh, we have the staff town halls on Monday, one in the morning, one in the evening. Uh, excuse me, family town halls on Monday, uh, one, in the, one in the morning, one in the evening. Staff town hall today, we'll have follow-up meetings with smaller groups of staff. We have a student town hall for middle school, high school students next Wednesday afternoon. Uh, you know, there was already an article in the newspaper, so that was excellent in terms of getting the community involved. We have a date for CPAC uh, for a staff town hall there, or a CPAC uh, meeting with them. We're working with our bilingual parent advisory group, hopefully getting a meeting scheduled soon. Our PGOs, there was a poll out trying to get PGO feedback. Uh, March is working with the Family Center Parent Advisory Group to have a meeting. We have a date now for next Wednesday with Leverett Elementary School. We're waiting to hear back from Shoots Bear Elementary School for uh, a date and time. So we really are trying to spread our wings uh, and make sure everyone is informed and get that feedback. We'll have a survey going out next Wednesday evening. Um, and it's pretty simple surveys, no surprises here. You know, what's your connection to which school, what's your role, um, and you know, what are advantages you see in option A? What are some challenges or questions you have about that? What are some benefits to option B. 
what are some challenges and which would you prefer, right? Much like Northampton, I don't think we need a 40 question survey for this. It's really um, some qualitative and quantitative data that, that we'll have for you, uh, have to bring back to you. And um, we wanna make sure that that engagement, we get all that feedback and can share that with you by late February, because I think that when we get to that March 2nd date, it's probably about as late as we can go, both for families to plan, but also logistically for our transportation department to plan. They are working uh, nonstop on this. Um, I can geek out. I mean, they have really cool tools of how they make routes. They've already revised hypothetical routes because uh, they have, their tool shows like a map view, but it also shows like through Google Earth, like literally you can look at, oh, well, we can't do that because the sidewalk ends at that street. And so we can't do it. We're getting to that granular level of detail. Um, but, but in terms of communicating with families about that, we really need some time to be able to do that. This is just a summary of, of uh, those, some of those engagements. And then the last slide is just showing that these are five, and I'm sure there's more, but five pretty prominent professional groups who have fully written statements to endorse state or to late starter time. Again, those hyperlinks to each of their statements. But when you're talking about American Medical Association, Center for Disease Control, American Academy of Pediatrics, Society of Behavioral Medicine, and the American Psychological Association, you're talking about five really, really significant organizations that don't casually write position papers. Right. They're going to really want to make sure their members are fully agree and endorse this. And so, you know, I end with that because I think uh, because it's not what we've done here, it can be really hard. But we have the experts in the field telling us that uh, what we're doing based on when we start our secondary schools is having a really negative impact on kids. Um, you know, if you go to these websites, they don't have tons of position papers on every topic. But the fact that all of them chose this topic to have a position paper on, I think is really telling in terms of the potential impact it can have and the beneficial impact it can have on students. So it's a little more than six minutes, I apologize, but I'll stop there um, and see if there's questions or comments uh, on this topic. Thank you. Any uh, questions, comments? Ms. Spitzer. Thanks for the presentation. I added to the chat a statement from the American Thoracic Society um, when I was at their conference last year. I, I met some very strong advocates as soon as they heard I was also on the school committee. We're like, well, you've got to change your start time. So I, I, I start with that because I don't want to seem like I'm throwing cold water on any of this because I, I think this is the right thing to do. I don't think there's a question about whether or not our students will, especially the secondary kids students, will, will benefit. And I guess that's so part of what I'm I'm going to advocate for is if I think you know I'm inclined to vote in favor of this and I'm also but though inclined to really think we need to get into the loop and start problem solving for the people it's going to have a negative impact on I don't think we need to start convincing teenagers that this is the right thing to do or, or even the parents of teenagers but I'm really concerned about how it's going to have an impact on on younger parents of younger kids just it's it's going to change the logistics and in a year that's been really hard logistically for anybody who's caring for small children it's going to feel maybe even harder i think potentially than it would have in a year when we weren't also dealing with all of the challenges that we've had with the pandemic with parents having to totally rearrange their schedules but maybe this is an opportunity to do it because we are already have had to be so um, incredibly flexible so I, I guess i'm just thinking about when we and, and I guess you've recorded this presentation, but I, I, I think, um, so it may be too late, but I think I think it will be important as we go through this process to really not worry so much about selling people on this idea, because I, I think we all recognize how important sleep is, but I think it is, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be difficult. And I think working, especially with the after school programs is gonna be really important and trying to engage parents early on to think about um, how they're going to be problem solving for the for the change in the schedule because it's going to the problem is that so some people have kids who are in an elementary school and also have younger kids who aren't yet in elementary school there aren't daycares that miss, like a two o'clock closure is a big gap between when a lot of the other um, schools for young children close it's at least that's my experience and I know there are a whole bunch of others so anyways I'm just thinking like is this going to affect the preschool too or are we going to be closing well, the preschool already closes at noon, so are we going to be moving that one to an even earlier? Anyways, I'll, these are the weeds, and I'll, we don't need to get into them tonight, but... Dr. Morris? 
Yeah, so just very quickly, we're not thinking of ending our school day at two o'clock. So at the elementary level, again, we're looking at like 20 to 25 minutes earlier. So currently buses get there at 8.30, 8.35. We're talking about getting buses getting there at 8.10. So if you think of the tail end of the day, we'd, the school day has to be the same length, right? Like uh, I'm not, no one is proposing changing the length of the school day. I mean, if you all do, you can go into negotiations on that topic. I'm not proposing that you do that at the moment. Um, um, so really we're talking about, you know, a, a, and I'm not trying to minimize the impact. We're not, Northampton has a very different schedule than ours. And, and um, I know they have a two o'clock time and that's maybe some feedback to put this up, but we're thinking of like 2.40, 2.45, right? We're not thinking of two o'clock as an end time. So again, I don't want to minimize that, that there's a difference with that, but it's the, it's not as large as Northampton's flip is because uh, they're running three bus runs and that's why it, it plays out a little differently for them. Oh, and preschool, I, I think, you know, that's something that transportation is actively working on as well. But again, um, it might be a little bit earlier, um, but if, if it runs at a similar time as elementary, then it, again, the adjustment is not more than 20, 25 minutes. Other questions? Mr. Demlin? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would agree and echo with, with Ms. Spitzer's general comment about the impact to elementary and that we kind of have to think of this as affecting half of our families in a fundamentally different way. Um, and I don't, I don't know enough, and I haven't heard, obviously, from the surveys that we haven't done yet <laughs> um, uh, and heard from the forums about, you know, what that all impact will be. Maybe it's neutral, maybe, you know, and, but finding out what the concerns are so that it's, it's not, so that we don't just promote it as, well, this is obviously better for older kids, so we just have to do it, right? Um, I mean, I think I think it's okay to be authentic about our general enthusiasm and excitement, and the um, and how well established the research is. I don't think there's any reason not to be, um, you know, forward about that. Um, but I do think I do think there there is um, we do need to make a concerted effort to listen to. The, the many families who won't immediately benefit from it, right? Their children will eventually get older, <laughs> hopefully go to the region. Um, but, you know, in terms of like selling it, I mean, I think um, but when, when, when I talk to, when I talk to educators, when I talk to um, parents of older kids, it, it, yes, overwhelmingly there is support for this, but, um, but but still, I, th I think we can get a little too, we can assume a little too much that everybody just assumes that this is a good idea. Um, and that's, so I, I do think, I, I really like the way that you've presented it so that you, you were making the case, right? Um, so like, as I saw, it's, it's both, it's, it's, it's making the case um, in terms of education. And you know, the other thing that, I mean, I feel, I think I've said this before, but I feel like I have to say this every time because I've like <laughs> pushed to get this item on our agenda for so long, is that, um, I mean, I'm obviously wanting this to work out, but I'm, I don't want to lock myself in to voting for it before we've gone through the process right like it's we, we we still do need to hear from our community we still need to do these do this engagement in a in a real way and, and dig into these issues um so you know I'm, i certainly am committed to being open-minded and um uh you know and, and and weighing all that and and then doing what i feel is the is the best for 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 students at the end of the day um but um yeah, it is, it, it is a little bit of a tricky balance of being like really excited for something that we feel is really positive and also wanting, you know, the decision balance to play out. So. I think I'll, um, if I see Mr. Sullivan, if, I, if you will allow me <laughs> to speak first. Um, I, I think one of the things that I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Mr. Demling, about sort of like we're going through the process just to remind viewers that the conversation that we're having was and that the only thing that the, the school committees have agreed to is to explore this so i think that's a really important um point to make is we're we're exploring it we want to hear what the issues are and what the concerns or um accolades might be for like yay this is <laughs> we want this change or um here's all the reasons why this is going to be bad for me and my family we, we want to hear that um, so that we can make an informed decision. Um, and, I, and I like that you're proposing that it's March 2nd, so I think the community, um, that will be helpful for the community. 
Um, and I also want to encourage us as we're going through this learning process, um, I'm, you know, keeping an open mind is really important, but also not assuming that this, that all secondary students are going to see this as a positive and all elementary students are going to see this as a negative. Um, because I, I, um, I can guarantee that that's not going to be here. <laughs> um, and I, for one, when I was an elementary parent, I would have celebrated having my kids going to school earlier in the day, just to be clear. So it's really easy to project sort of assumptions. And, and I think the whole learning process that you just outlined, Dr. Morris, I think will really help us to hear from multiple perspectives um, what the impact will be. And I just want to ask a clarifying question before I turn it over to Mr. Sullivan for his question. Um, is when the survey goes out, you said it's going to go out next Wednesday, will pieces of that, um, those options and sort of things that will be explained um, as sort of a preamble to go along, like an FAQ to go along with that survey? Yeah, so that's why we did the, the, we did the recording and it'll be done bilingually and with the slide deck is already available. We already have that translated um, so that if people want more context, they have both the slides but also a narrated um, walk through of the slides so that they can have access to, to more than just um, why we're considering it. Now, all those things, again, it's pretty tight, six minutes. No one wants to hear me for that, that long uh, before they take a survey, so I tried to make it a, as short as possible. Thanks. And Mr. Sullivan. Hi. It's interesting because at the Shrewsbury School Committee about 15 minutes ago, we had this same discussion, and I just want to point out that I've been a very vocal opponent of this for five plus years and I have turned the corner but I just want to point out that Shootsbury is not just a bystander it's going to affect the Shootsbury school schedule by at least 15 minutes if not more even though we are not choosing to change our start times and I believe it's probably the same for Leverett with the same bus company. Yeah, that's if I could comment on that. I think it's really important. And that's why we've been collaborating, communicating so much with our Union 28 colleagues and, and um, setting up meetings with them and, and um, definitely heard from Jackie, you know, and Steve will know who I'm talking about uh, very clearly about some some parameters that she feels like she needs to make this work for Shootsbury. And uh, as best we can, we're trying to take all those things into account. But I really appreciate your perspective and I'm glad it's being talked about there and, and I just really want to thank um, Jackie, Annie, uh, who are the principals in Shoots Baron Leverett and, and Jen Colkeen and Bruce Turner, their transportation coordinator, because it's it's I learned so much from talking to them that, you know, until you talk to them, you don't know. Um, and you know, much like Pelham, it's a small school and small schools sometimes have traditions uh, and values that are really, really important to them that maybe people from the outside wouldn't necessarily realize. So Really, really appreciate that point, Steve, and appreciate uh, the folks over there uh, working with us so well. Other questions or observations? I don't see many. And I'm also going to just acknowledge and welcome back Mr. Harrington and Mr. Sullivan, who each had other commitments and retired and returned. Um, great. Did you have anything more in your presentation, Dr. Morris? No. no, I think when we talk about upcoming agendas, you know, I think we just want to maybe figure out times before March where they're, it shouldn't all come to you on March 2nd. Be like, oh, this is what people thought, right? You should have a chance to deliberate um, earlier. And so, you know, I think, but we can talk about that when we get to what okay. I believe is the next agenda item. Yeah, so it's a good segue. <laughs> So if, I, if there's no more comments on um, or discussion on changing school start times, then we can move on. I'm not seeing any objections. Um, move on then to our future agenda planning. And would folks like me to share my the document that we? Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, put that to a shareable spot. <laughs> Ms. McDonald, I did some, some potential editing this afternoon thinking about this. So if you didn't see it, I'm sorry if it's coming as a surprise to you. It's <laughs> just publicly to everyone watching. So um, we can talk through. Like, it doesn't look like it's sharing. Yep. yep. Oh, it is. Okay. It is yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
so we are here on the 21st. Um, the region um, is having a meeting on the 2nd of February um, to where we'll look at the FY22 budget and hear an update on the Q2 of the current of FY21. Um, we'll have an update on attendance and distance learning and school choice. And then that's um, the budget presentation is in preparation for our fact for towns meeting, which is scheduled for Saturday morning, February 6th. Um, and it looks like um, the February 23rd date is the one um, that you're talking about, Dr. Morris, that we return back um, with a joint meeting uh, to talk about school start times. And then the Amherst committee will continue to have its Q2 budget update um, and initial look at the FY22 budget. As yeah. Well. I, so, so to be clear, originally Ms. McDonald had that on February 9th, but I think just from a workflow perspective of the business, the business office to have the February 2nd, February 6th, February 9th, and then February 11th is the Pelham meeting. Um, it's just, you know, three separate budgets. It almost is like every other day presenting some budget information. And, you know, I want to, I respect Dr. Slaughter and his team's work. And it just felt like that's not a sustainable model to have them bunched in that way, particularly this year. So I apologize. It means the 23rd is probably a long evening. Um, but I, I just, I don't think on February 9th, we'd be in a great position to, to go into detail on the Amherst budget um, that way. Mr. Demling. Um, so, okay, that makes sense with what you just described because that was my first thought is that we haven't um, we haven't dove deep into the Amherst School Committee budget situation um, for next year and what, and what that projects to be. So that's, that's, that's definitely on my thought radar, but you know, whenever it slots in appropriately, um, be, be anxious to, to get that. Uh, we did have a, on our to-do list, follow up on the commandante's uh, sibling policy um, oh. that again um i i would advocate at the region to get the sixth grade um to the middle school discussion item on there sooner rather than later um since this is a joint meeting i'll just say again i, I think it makes sense sequentially for the region to be able to have that discussion and then if we establish that that's even possible then it flows to the Amherst school committee to make that decision of whether that's six is going to middle school and that has obvious impacts to building projects and whatnot. So um, getting that up would be good. Uh, I think that's. So you, uh, you're asking for sooner than uh, March 9th. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, see that item there. I was, I was scanning for sixth to arms and I didn't interpret grade span report correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, very well then. Thank you. <laughs> Um, given that the 23rd is uh, a long meeting for um, our Amherst colleagues, um, I'm just trying to think creatively if there's opportunity to have um, a joint meeting and then a separate Amherst meeting on, on a Thursday um, that week or vice versa, whichever um, folks. Um, I see Dr. Morris nodding in there. <laughs> well, I think you know, my advice would be um, since Amherst doesn't have conflicts on Thursdays, I, members may, but like, there's not like, like Steve had one tonight, you know, yeah. I just, I want to be conscious of that, that if we did the joint yeah. meeting on Tuesdays and the Amherst on a Thursday, then that would potentially at least not create conflicts for our regional colleagues. What do the um, Amherst uh, folks think about that sort of shifting our meeting, the, that meeting to 24th, 25th? Two reasonable, moderate length meetings or one marathon meeting, I guess. Ms. Spitzer. Um, I, I think I would rather just get it all done in one night or my to benefit my husband so he doesn't have to put our children to bed alone more than once a week. Um, but I know I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm amenable to others. I, if we do have two meetings, I would just ask to make certain that the second meeting end by say like 7.30 or eight, that would be fine. I just like to be present for my family in the evenings. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, and I'm fine either way to be clear. Whatever makes sense for the committee is fine. Okay. Great. Any other um, thoughts on this? Ms. Spitzer. Um, at the earlier meeting with the APA, we talked about an executive session to discuss authorizing um, Dr. Morris for negotiations. I don't know how that's going to fit in, but I think we should make sure that's on the calendar, but potentially. Yep. Just going to put it here to not forget it, but. Um... Okay. Mr. Demling. Yeah, um, that actually brings up a, a good point. Um, so we passed, like, so, we, so the in-person volunteer plan, right? Um, one would imagine, not next week, obviously. Um, one would imagine at some point, you know, between now and February, you will you will have the plan, you know? <laughs> yeah. It'll be ready for implementation. It'll be more than just item seven and superintendent's update, right? And so we can expect that to take a fair bit. Um, and I would imagine that you would want, you know, once you have something that is that you've worked through with collaboration and whatnot, um, that you have uh, you're, that you're getting close to finalizing, that you would want to get school committee feedback on it. So I'm imagining that's going to be some kind of a I, an item that consumes some number, uh, some amount of time on one of these dates. <laughs> I don't know exactly yes. how we brought that in without, you know, knowing more than we know right now, but. Absolutely. Agree. Agree on both ends of that. Yes, it should happen. We don't exactly know where to block it in, but it needs to happen. Yeah. I'm just dumping them all in the second right now. That's what I mean. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts there? No? Okay. Um, I do. I do know also that there was um, a request for um, a presentation from the SETF um, in February, and we also had a request to present um, from CPAC. Um, so we don't have the sort of preferred dates from um, both of those, but um, those, I believe, both groups wanted. February. So uh, February seems pretty packed and I'm, I, I'm going to ask, see if we, would, our um, SETF team and CPAC rep might be able to see if March might be amenable for those two groups. Um, so we can sort of cover that off uh, separately. Um, my next item is warrant reports and I have one for Amherst. Um, Ms. Spitzer, do you have? You do. Um, so I have mine up. Uh, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, I authorized by my signature um, uh, payments to uh, for payroll in the amount of $635,567.54 for it, uh, the payroll dated January 13th, 2021. And I signed that on January 8th, 2021. Ms. Spitzer? So I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $614,990.41 for the warrant dated January 13th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $612,584.16 and grant fund expenses of $2,406.25. And this was signed in, um, sorry, signed on January 13th, 2021. Um, I also authorized um, a warrant for annual scholarship payments in the amount of $1,000. And this was dated um, January 19th, 2021. And that is all. Did you, you're on mute, Allison. Did you just call on me? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Sorry, Claire Hall. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $54,564.87 for the warrant dated January 14th, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $28,139.62 and grant fund expenses of $26,425.25. And I signed that on January 15th, 2021. Super. Um, I don't think we had gifts tonight. Oh, Dr. Morris? I don't have a monetary gift, but I had some images I'd like to show you to bring a little levity because you're in a lot of meetings. So gift is maybe uh, OML. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for this, but uh, many people know that Bernie Sanders is, uh, lives in the state north of us. They don't know about his experiences in our community. So if I could indulge you in five images sharing uh, a little bit of his time with us, I, I hope that's okay. So uh, you, you might remember our musical Spring Awakening. Um, there was Bernie interacting with students, a lover of theater, uh, musical theater. Thanks to Mr. Bechtold for arranging front row seat for him right on stage. Also attended uh, our graduation uh, exercises at the Mullen Center when we were able to. And little known fact about Bernie is that he actually is a lover of sports. And here he is with our Western Mass Championship football team. And as well as a couple years ago, our Western Mass volleyball team. Um, so just thought I'd share that, that he, you know, we really welcome uh, politicians, people who want to visit our area and visit the district. Really appreciate his support of the Amherst Regional Public Schools. Um, so that is the gifts for tonight. <laughs> that that was great. And yes, thank you, Mr. Sanders. <laughs> yep. And Mr. Champagne for his help. Just, you know, just it just touching up those images just a little bit. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I will make a motion for the Amherst School Committee. I will move that the Amherst School Committee adjourns. Is there a second? Second. Uh, uh, seconded by Spitzer. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Amherst is adjourned. Chair Hall. All right, I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. Second and vice Stancer. All right, roll call vote. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Thanks, everyone. And I will move that the Regional School Committee adjourns. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. Roll call vote, Mr. Demling. Emling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Olaf and Mr. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The region uh, is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amherst Media. <laughs>